Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, as Dr. Shukla pointed out, I uh, come from the field of clinical trials. And uh, you heard already some challenges on harmonization and uh, data collection, the methodology, the implementation, planning, and so on, and putting some light on that in the context of clinical trials. So let's get going. Oh, I have to, sorry. Yeah, so a quick disclaimer, so the view expressed here are mine and not necessarily Cytel's. This is going on a public platform, so important to mention that. And a lot of this is borrowed from uh, public sources. You will yourself have access to all of that. It's not necessarily my original content. In fact, I give you some references for uh, looking up things later that you might feel interested in. Uh, so uh, we talked about data and we talked about standards a little bit, especially about harmonization and so on. Uh, the desire of uh, all analysts and researchers, obviously, uh, is that the data should be disciplined, it should be systematic, it should be structured, it should be complete, accurate, consistent. This is a dream world, okay? This is, this is the hope of researchers. A researcher, if uh, they get data like this, they would be happy uh, in uh, analysis later on becomes easier. And in the field of clinical trials, it is often feasible to do that because there's a very, uh, uh, very strict standard enforcement. Uh, that is possible because a clinical trial typically is a designed experiment. Okay, it's not incidental available data. You're creating an experiment to collect data in a particular format. But that's not always the case. Uh, you know, in clinical trials, you have that opportunity. But in real world, Data can actually be chaotic. Uh, you know, in a general uh, lighthearted sense, one could say that the entropy of the universe tends to, uh, um, tends to infinity, which means basically left to themselves, many things become chaotic automatically. So the real world tends to be chaotic. It's our job to bring some order to it. And that is where all this technology of computers as well as statistics and analytics uh, needs to be deployed. So the data in real uh, situation is often indisciplined, unsystematic, is the opposite of everything that was said on the previous slide. Okay, And you don't have an opportunity to uh, go back and correct it because the data happens to be there already and you are trying to utilize it to the extent possible. And that is where there are challenges. Of course, harmonization, both at the input and output, as Dr. Chaudhary pointed out, can help us bring some order. But uh, many times there is limited opportunity and scope for that. And uh, that's the area in which we work, especially in clinical trials. What is the, uh, what's the role of statisticians and uh, uh, data scientists? Statisticians, basically statistics is the science of uncertainty. So when there is uncertainty, when there is uncertainty about the data, where is, when there is limited data, where is, when there is uncertainty of uh, uh, inference or implication, that's when statistical techniques are required. And increasingly now, computing techniques are utilized for uh, making sense of data, bringing uh, you know, order and harmonization and sensible interpretation. So these two things, statistics and computer science, jointly, uh, you know, they, they've given rise to this field called data science, and I'm sure all of you will cross paths with, with that sometime. You may or may not choose to make that your primary focus, but even if you don't, it's going to be a necessary tool in your toolkit, and therefore, uh, that is relevant for all of this. So, uh, you know, that's the difference between controlled trials, like clinical trials typically are controlled trials. They are designed in advance, and then they are uh, executed and implemented very uh, 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 very disciplinedly in a particular manner. In fact, you may be aware that there are data standards uh, which are enforced in clinical trials, especially in control studies. There is a standard called CDISC that you might have heard of, which is basically Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium. That's the name of the body which enforces that standard. And that is an extremely exacting standard. Dr. Chaudhary gave us the example of how one simple date can be written in 20 different ways. Okay, and that is the exact problem that data standards seek to prevent, nip in the bud from the beginning. But like I said, that is possible only if you are collecting data for, a, for an experiment you designed. 
which is different from you are now doing research on data that was already collected, that already happens to be there. And you often need to deal with both, and especially in your field in epidemiology and in community kind of studies, you are often going to encounter data that already exists. You were not involved in the process in uh, designing the data collection and collecting the data. The data, data are already there, so what do you do with it now? And that is when all these techniques are required. And uh, in our context, we call it real world data as distinct from experimental data. Real world data is records collected from the hospitals, record collected from patient questionnaires, uh, and records collected incidentally from various sources. We'll see some of those interesting uh, sources, uh, and uh, we opportunistically try to utilize uh, that in a sense which is statistically sound. Uh, and uh, you know you can still use it for making some inferences. Oops, it's not moving. Okay. Yeah. So drug development data and clinical trials data, basically, it's uh, uh, it's a sequence of capturing the data, then collecting the data, and then assimilating, and in that process, harmonization and other things we talked about already. And there are some conventional long-standing ways of collecting data, but there are some new ones that are coming up. Uh, CRF is the most common uh, case report form. That's the most common form in which clinical trial data is collected. And traditionally, uh, you also had additional sources like adjudication and laboratory data and questionnaires for the patients and all. But in all of these, you have the opportunity of dictating a very well-disciplined standard and ensuring clean data, complete data, reliable data, et cetera, et cetera. But increasingly, what is happening uh, now is there are additional uh, things becoming available, uh, like uh, there are biomarker data, there are diaries, there are uh, patient-reported outcomes and uh, antibodies. Uh, and then there are other unconventional emerging sources like electronic health records that exist in the healthcare system in the hospitals now. Uh, th that's the real world data, basically. Uh, uh, there, there's also social media, by the way. Sorry, the sequence is, uh, uh, it, it seems to be random, so let me get everything on board together. Uh, so there are images and ECG data, uh, which we have from hospitals that is increasingly being utilized to analyze uh, in an intelligent way. Images can be analyzed in order to extract data. That is happening increasingly now. There is PKPD data, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. But on the modern side, there's also social media and there's mobile health, devices, patient engagement, etc. You might wonder, how can social media data be used? Probably you are already aware because you work more in the real world area than I do. I work more in the experimental area. But in, in social media also, simple things like on Twitter, uh, comments that patients make based, of, based on their experience with a certain treatment or therapy, those can also be uh, you know, uh, utilized for extracting sensible and reliable data. It's important to have it sensible and reliable because without which, uh, if you don't have that assurance, uh, you, you will probably end up with incorrect conclusions. Uh, but uh, there are ways to uh, weed out uh, you know, data that uh, should not be utilized as distinct from data that could be utilized. But you have all of this uh, interaction with patients and uh, M Health is mobile health. Basically, nowadays you have devices uh, in the new technology. You might be familiar with Apple Watch or so many other smart watches now, which continuously record certain biological parameters and log that data. So you, you don't even have to go to a center or a hospital. Uh, the data is getting collected all the time. So all of this combined together is to be poured into the cauldron and then we have to do harmonization also and then we have to also s selectively pick data that can make sense and that can be utilized for studies. By the way, in uh, controlled clinical trials, often there are multiple arms. There is a control arm and a treatment arm. What you are generally doing, basically, is a new treatment is being compared with an, either an existing treatment or a placebo uh, kind of a blinded uh, situation. Uh, so nowadays, what is happening increasingly is that the control arm, which means the reference against which the new treatment will be compared, that is picked up not necessarily experimentally from a new trial, but from data that already exists, because hospitals are already 
producing, I mean, providing treatment with an existing established drug in the market. And that, if that happens to be your control, then that data already exists. You don't have to again enroll volunteer patients and again put them through that motion. So it can accelerate your clinical research if you can use that control arm from the real world. And that is called synthetic control arm. Because it's not created in an experimental way, it just happens to be there. You collect data from whatever hospitals are willing to share that data with you and convert that into a control arm. And that uh, virtually halves your task if you are I mean, roughly equal if uh, you are doing control and treatment. So that is called synthetic control arm and that often comes from real world. And that requires all this harmonization and cleaning and weeding out and sometimes interpolating missing figures. If there are missing pieces of data, what do you do? Do you discard the entire record or do you try to make an intelligent guess of what that missing data might be? Is making that intelligent guess going to uh, damage the statistical uh, solidity? All of that you have to consider, but that synthetic control arm can uh, be utilized sometimes. So in doing all this, there are many technologies uh, at play and especially computing technologies, modern computing technologies. And you can see that there is a close interplay of all of those in this, uh, in, in this entire process. So I'll just... Uh, uh, quickly put everything on the screen uh, because uh, uh, you know you'll get the full picture. So if you look at the sequence, there is a statistical design uh, first of a clinical trial when you're conducting a clinical trial. Then there is enrollment of subjects, which is patients basically, volunteer patients. And then there is monitoring of the study, then there is data management of the data collected. And then finally, there is analysis, where biostatistics is involved, is involved and data science is involved. So if you look at the technologies, computing technologies, uh, you know, cloud for data storage and secure data storage with secrecy and uh, with protection of uh, privacy, etc. Then uh, sometimes the data sizes being large, big data is required. Then we, I talked about wearables and internet of things. So there are many technologies at play, analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning. And you know, there's, a, uh, there's an intersection of uh, many of these techniques needing, uh, being needed uh, in many situations. So uh, to this audience, all of this is uh, you're going to encounter at some point or another and my point was to basically scratch the surface and show you what you are likely to run into. Sometimes what happens at the early stage of your career is you might be from a biology background and this can appear to be daunting uh, if it's mathematical or statistics or computer science, etc. I want to assure you that if you have the curiosity and the interest, it's not all that difficult because the, uh, the uh, modern education, modern technology also developed so much that you can learn applications without learning the deep down theory. And many times learning the deep down theory of every field is not necessary. You're already a master of your own field. These others you have to use as tools of the trade and understand how to use them. You don't need to get into complex theory. You don't have to go under the bonnet. You just need to understand the application that's highly possible now. So, you know, uh, young professionals should be encouraged to take the plunge and look at all of these. That's quite important. So the skills requirement, basically, if you look at uh, you know, what, what the modern data scientist in this field, in healthcare data scientist requires, is drug development, of course, from my field, or I, I can broaden that into healthcare in general, or community healthcare, uh, but also quantitative methods and computer science. And that's what I was mentioning, that although that may not be your specialized field of study, uh, you know, it's going to be necessary to uh, dabble into that. And you are at the intersection of all three, and that's where the healthcare data scientist stands today, and that's what you need to do. So in terms of in closing, uh, I'll just uh, point out to you uh, a bunch of public sources from which excellent clinical trials data is very readily available. Most of these are free, absolutely free. But some of those are even paid, but if you are researchers or if you are, uh, uh, if you are needing data for your projects or studies, these are just some of them and you'll find a bunch more, many more, but I just wanted to give a cross section across the globe. Uh, you know, many uh, global regulators now, they make it mandatory uh, for uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies 
to put their clinical trials data in public domain. That is a mandatory necessity. It's not an option. And therefore, all of these uh, various countries, data regulators, they ensure that the data are loaded in a specific format, they are validated and so on. Of course, they are anonymized. You will not get individual uh, personal information. That is important. But there is an enormous resource available now at your fingertips from which you can extract data for your research and work. And this is just a small sample. And uh, you know, because we had limited time today, I, knew, I know that we are not going to have a lot of time for questions and answers. But the idea he here is to uh, uh, stoke your curiosity and interest. And if you have more questions, uh, I will welcome them even later. I'd like to engage with you and answer any specific questions you might have later. My email address uh, is uh, ajay.sathe at gmail.com, but I, I guess you will get it through the uh, presentations when they are loaded also. So I would like to engage with anyone who is curious to know more and more specifics, because I realize that we barely scratched the surface today. Thank you.